विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण प्रसाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इतिने
श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गुप्त गुप्त ने श्याम कुंड भारत कुंड गिर गोदान की वृंदावन धाम की मथुरा धाम की नवद्वीप धाम की जगन्नाथपुरी की जगन्नाथ स्वामी की गंगा मई की जमुन मई की तुलसी देवी की भक्ति देवी की हरे कृष्ण महामंत्र की सामवीर भक्त बिंद की हिताय गो प्रेम नंदे हरिभो All glory is to the assembled bodies. All glory is to the assembled bodies. All glory is to the assembled bodies. All glory is all glory is to the Lord Shri Guru and Goranga. Shri Guru and Goranga. Okay, now we do one round with Japa. Yeah, sixteen hundred. Would you one round with Japa? Yeah, Prabhuji. Two feet, one time. Would you one round with Japa? Did you have? Should I use this? Yeah. Okay. We turn together. This one should have probably been chanting fast, so we can just chant as a group together. It's very hard to keep up with them with this one. <laughs> it's going really fast. So who's going to lead the chant? You want to do it? Okay. Okay, yeah. <coughs> जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्री वासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गुरु भगवान के चरण फिर भी श्री शास्त्री ने वाली पत्र चार्ज से चार जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद से द्वैत गदाधर शिवाजी गोविंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे नमः विष्णु प्रदाय विष्णु प्रदाय भूतले सुमाति बक्ति तेरे स्वामी को जाने नमस्ते कृष्ण प्रदाय पापु पारस प्रदाय तेरे सुबोध कर शक्ति बक्ति नाने लीला माये विद्याहाया विमादे दुबे सदिशन विराय तस्माय महात्मे नमः प्रदाय चितान्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चितान्य चंद्राय नमो नमस्ते चितान्य चंद्रा Everybody has hand out. Yes. So, the nectar of the holy name. So, the first sentence here is that all the perfections of a yoga system can be realized by mantra yoga, the chanting of Hare Krishna. From the authoritative sources, we learn that this chanting of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. That's the embodiment for the perfection of yoga for this age. So this age, Kali Yuga, the way in which Krishna is invoked is through his holy name. So we've got the extreme blessing of Krishna coming to us through his holy name. There is no difference, as the Shastra explains, between Krishna and his holy name. Because Krishna is absolute, so we have different things. We have a body, that's our body. Our name is our name. Hmm? Our soul is our soul. But Krishna is absolute. Everything about him is also him. It's hard to kind of understand that, but if we accept that, then we have Krishna just by chanting Krishna's name. Now, Lord Chaitanya has also explained that all the transcendental potencies, all the energies of Krishna beneficial to us have all been put in his holy name. So once you chant Krishna's name, you have Krishna as well as all of his potencies. So some people begin to think, well, I'm chanting Hare Krishna, I don't feel much difference in my life. The process of advancement in devotee life is a gradual process. Just like the women know already, 
if you marry, you want, you know, you have a husband, you want a child, you decide you're going to have a child. So you start the process of union for having the child. You have the union. The next day, the child doesn't come. It takes nine months for the child to come. So there has to be patience. And there has to be a process of the female body going through the changes to have the child, to have the child grow, and basically have the child advance in the womb to become a real human. Then, one day, the child actually comes out. So it's always a gradual process. There is no rest. You cannot be impatient in Krishna consciousness. It's not possible. You go through it. The chanting of Hare Krishna my mantra is a very potent because uh, mantra because this is the mantra for this age. Lord Chaitanya, which Krishna himself and Radha combined, says chant like that. And so with the chanting, when you do it, then the process keeps you the purification and slowly you mature too be an advanced devotee. An advanced devotee is one that's humble. An advanced devotee is the one that doesn't offend anybody. All of these are characteristics, qualities um, that come with hearing as well as chanting the name. So to come back to this handout, the next paragraph says, today we have great difficulties <coughs> living 50 or 60 years. Every day is anxiety situation. <laughs> If you go to 80 or 100 years, well, in one sense, people say you live to a ripe old age when you go 80 to 100 years. Sometimes, when you think about it, you even begin to question, is it necessary to go to 80 or 100 years? What does the physical body look like when you're 80, 90, 100? Especially if you're in the West, where so many toxins, poisons are in the food, they call them preservatives, right? But they're not really, they preserve the food, keep them a little longer, but then when you take it in the physical body, it weakens the body also. So many people, when you go to the uh, nursing homes, yes, they are 70, yes, they are 80, yes, they are 90, but what do they look like? Their bodies have deteriorated so much. They used to be, and I'm from African background, you're from Indian background, there's so many things that are similar, that earlier, when our food wasn't contaminated so much with all of these so-called preservatives, okay, the older persons, they lived a long time, but they never got seen up, right? That is, their minds didn't go, their bodies didn't go down so much. So you could learn a lot from them because they had lived life a longer time. They got a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience. Therefore, you could, so many things they could teach us. But now, an older person is like a vegetable. You have to try to care for them because their minds are going down so much because of the way we're living this Kali Yuga is very artificial type of living. It's all based on business, making profit. When you, they will tell you and advertise it's good for you, whatever they're advertising. But really, all they want is the money. And they don't really care so much about us and our health and so on. So we have to be very, very, very careful. See, the Papa says, simplify. Simplify as much as we can, simplify. If we don't have a choice, that's one thing. But then, as much as possible, we have to think in terms of simplification. So... Living however many years to a ripe old age, whatever is defined, we know it's usually up to 100 maximum. So much anxiety is there, as I said in this year. Difficulties, circumstances of war, pestilence, famine, so many other disturbances. The other day, I watched YouTube. I don't know why I did that, but I just... Um, it was about um, some two Americans... Two Americans, white-bodied Americans, men. They went to West <clears throat> Africa. And they went to Liberia, the country called Liberia in West Africa. Liberia has gone through so many civil wars. I mean, civil wars, I should say so many. One civil war for a long time. Okay. This person, he became president, they caught him, finally they fought against him. So about three different factions fighting. And... These two Americans that went really put their life at risk to go. But when they got there, they were fortunate. Krishna was with them, whether they know it or not. And um, they got protected through many dangerous situations. Sometimes, depending on the warlord that they were talking to, the leaders of whatever gang were fighting, some of them did not want any video camera on them. And they were very smart enough to cooperate, whatever they said, because they had guns and stuff. Right? They were fighting. So they don't want the camera. It's all right. The camera is turned off. You could hear the sound still, but they turned the camera off. But you, know, you could still hear what they were saying. Um, 
And basically, it wasn't even so much that they were trying to find out what was wrong, but they were there to find out what the living conditions were because of the war. And you have to see, it's, it's, see, I watched the video of it. So I try to describe it, it's not as easy as you've seen it. And if you watch it and you look at the conditions they've been through, and you compare to us, we live like kings compared to what they go through. <coughs> there was so much famine because how do you go to the store? People are shooting and so on. They've been to the stores open at all. So storekeepers have run away. Some of them have shut their businesses. And it has become, food has become so scarce that and if you have this, you know, uh, if, you, if, if you can't stomach this, I'll say a few things about it. But if it's too much, maybe I won't go too deeply into it. What was available was human bodies. Because that's what they had killed in the war. So that's what they were eating. They had become cannibals. You can't go to a store. People are dead in the streets. Which you just take a person and cut some of the flesh. So that's what they were doing. It was horrible. And I'm saying, see, sometimes we look at this earth and some parts of it, like we're here, it sounds, you know, we've got comforts and so on. But this, on the same earth, the same mother bumi, all of these other problems are going on. So in one sense we're sheltered, but we should never ever get in the illusion that this planet is totally safe. We're just fortunate through karma or something or Christmas protection that we're in this part of it. But there's always other things going on in other parts of the world that are absolutely horrible. It's the same planet. So you see the Prabhupada has come to give us this particular mantra or to protect the mantra so in the West and so on because the mantra was already here before he came but Lord Chaitanya and those before him they're all telling us chant this Hare Krishna Maha mantra it is a saving mantra this is a mantra that helps us to develop love for Krishna and ultimately be able to go back to Godhead where all of these disturbances are not there it's very easy to overlook what's going on in other parts of the world, because in your world, in your small world, you're able to manage things. You get some the decent money, your husband is earning good money, and you're able <coughs> to go on, and you know, life is not as bad, because there's still anxieties. But, but, other parts of the world, and we could easily have been in that situation. You know, because you do not determine what happens to you in the next life, where you go depending on how you live your life. So if you don't take advantage of the situation now, this is, I remember very much, I watched another video that Siddha Papa was preaching, and he answered uh, a devotee who became my spiritual master later on, Bhakti Jira Maharaj. He asked the question about Kali Yuga. And so he said, because it ties into what I'm talking about, uh, we're talking about now. So Bhakti John, he was Bhakti John at the time, asked Siddha Papa. So you said uh, Kali Yuga is 5,000 years, 5,000 years into Kali Yuga. And Sri Papa said, yes. Now Kali Yuga is 432,000 years. So we just basically started Kali Yuga. 5,000 years ago, 427,000 years to go. And the situation gets worse and worse and worse and worse as you go. So as soon as that question was put to him, just to be sure, they said, okay, 5,000. So Sri Papa said, yes, it's 5,000 out of 432,000 years. And the situation is bad now, but it gets progressively worse and worse and worse and worse. So, while you are in a situation that is bad, but not as bad as it's going to get later, why don't you jump out? Get out and go back to Godhead. So my, um, you know, my teacher master at the time didn't ask about going back to Godhead. He was just <coughs> checking on, the, I guess he was thinking mathematically, 5,000 into this. But, it is very, 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 very serious. What about what's about to happen? What's happening now and what's about to happen in the future? And so when you have this mantra, the point we're making is we are actually more in an emergency situation than we realize. It's more of an emergency situation than we realize. By the mercy of, of, of Guru and Guranga, by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we're able to manage some, a little more peaceful in this part of the world. But the whole world is not like that. And you know from nation to nation, there's a lot of talk back and forth 
And it's not nice talk. Everybody <coughs> threatening. I've got nuclear weapons. I say, I have nuclear weapons. I'm doing this test here, and so on and so on and so on. Well, will Iran be attacked? No, maybe, maybe, whatever. So it's all a tense situation. All a tense situation. You add Israel to it, then I'd be taking hours and hours and hours. That's another situation. Okay, that's just talking. And then those who are actually um, in in wars. It's been said that there's an average of 35 wars going on on this earth at any time. A lot of them don't get reported. 35 wars around the whole earth, average. So there's so much quarrel in this, in this uh, Kali Yuga. So war, pestilence, famine, so many other disturbances. We're also not very intelligent, and at the same time, we are unfortunate. Actually, some people will question, well, we are not very intelligent. Well, we do well. We have our degrees and so on. Well, how many of us, how many of us can have something, a whole thing read to us, like what I've talked about? Then I say, repeat it. Everything I've said so far. Can you? Nobody here can do that. Well, there are those who call Shruti Dara, that you say something once, a whole thing once, and you can remember the entire thing. If you watch your Bhavatam, if you read your Bhavatam, seven, several times when questions are being asked, one devotee of the Lord is asking another devotee a set of questions. Now, in, in, you don't see that in, in Bhagavad Gita, because Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna would ask as most three questions. Hmm? What is a pure devotee? How can you realize him? How does he walk? About three questions and it stops there. Shema Bhavatam have seven or eight questions at one time asked of the person who is speaking. And they remember all of it. Because normally in Kali, you go, say, well, let me just take one question at a time, right? And then you can ask the other question. Then you can ask the other question. Because you can't retain the whole thing at one time. So actually, we are not very intelligent. A human can actually have a lot more. In other ages, they remember a lot more than we can now. Um, we're also unfortunate because in many ways, we're dealing with the three glaciers, the three problems, our own minds, and then disturbances, um, disturbances of my own mind, disturbances <coughs> from other living entities, and disturbances from the weather. Right now, we're in winter. Right? We'd love not to use our coats, but we have to use our coats now because we can't deal with the temperature. We've kind of come to accept, because there's really not much we can do, we just adjust with it and do the best that we can. But if we had a situation where we had nice weather all the time, all the time, and that's no, nowhere in the world has nice weather all the time. Even those who have warm weather, you have rain, monsoon, something will bother you from the weather. Okay? And then we have all of these other types of um, living entities that give us problems. Germs that give us sickness. I mean, flu is now just all over the place. Different types of flu. Everybody's got sickness one way or the other. So it's a very unfortunate situation because that's not how Krishna really wants us to live. But in the material world, these problems are here. And therefore, he says, get out of the material world. So those who want to be bosses, those who want to have Krishna's creation without Krishna himself being in control, those are the ones that are put here in the material world, those who envy Krishna. And so we're fortunate enough to now hear about the way to get out of the material world. And therefore, we have to take advantage of it. So the last sentence in this um, paragraph three, that paragraph three, today we have great difficulties. The last sentence says, these are the characteristics of man living in Kali Yuga, a degraded age, not intelligent, unfortunate, subject to war, subject to pestilence, subject to famine, so many other disturbances, all of that. And then we make it difficult in ourselves too because we don't have much compassion. Here we're living in a bad situation, but we don't help each other very much. So your fortunate because your culture, Indian culture, lends itself to more or more to witness, but it's not like that in so many other places. Go to the Middle East. <laughs> How do they do to each other? Okay, not to, no, I won't bring, but I'm teaching, in teaching I've come across so many students from different parts of the world. And I just watch them, how they behave, how they react towards me, how they react towards other students, how they react when they're failing, because I teach chemistry and it's a difficult subject for a lot of people. But I get to see all of this, you know, their, their, their interaction with the students, interaction with me, how they be able to pass, because if you want to get into the medical field, you can't get around chemistry, you have to take chemistry. Okay, and so... 
I'm, I'm, sometimes I'm the one, according to them, helping them to go on. Others do see me, I'm the block. I want to get to be a nurse, and this guy is in my way. They don't look at me as a teacher. The guy that's making it impossible for me to get to be a nurse. So I have to deal with all of these. In other words, the mentality is typical Kaliyuga mentality. It's so bad. And of course, there's those who are lazy. Typical students, they will put their notes aside until one week to the exam, three days to the exam. I have an exam on Tuesday, so they're, they're studying hard now. When they should have been studying the last four weeks, they should have been doing it. Laziness. They want to just enjoy sense gratification. This is the problem in Kaliyuga. So, to the next paragraph, properly speaking, we can never attain success in this meditation unless... I think there's something wrong here. In this meditation yoga system, we can... I don't think, I don't think never should be there. Attain success in the meditation yoga system described by Krishna. So... I think they, he's trying to say we cannot attain success using the meditation-based yoga system. Okay. Yeah. But then it says described yeah. by Krishna. Yeah. So, all right. So actually, bhakti yoga is the most important. But without that, okay, that, so then I was kind of like, at the outwards, we can only gratify <laughs> personal yeah. whims yeah. and some sort of, you know, thinking that we've adapted to the system well when we really have not. What's going on with the government, you know, and taxes? Um, it really shouldn't surprise anyone if you know a little bit about Srimad Bhavatam. Because Srimad Bhavatam, the, the cantos, the later cantos, 12th canto and so on, which is the last canto, it does say, though, that in the degradation of Kali Yuga, when times advance still, people will be taxed so much that they will want to get out of the system, you know, the government system. And some people will do that. But then to not be in the government system means you can't live within the cities and the villages. You can't do that because you have an address, they know you. You have bills, they know you. So you can't get out of the system like that. So people will actually take to the forest. They'll go in the woods and try to survive in the woods so that they're not in the system anymore so they don't have to pay taxes. So tax increase will go on and on and on. Don't expect it to go anywhere. As Cayuga goes on, it's going to get more and more and more. The only reasonable thing to do is to chant the Hare Krishna mantra, develop love of Godhead, and by the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Guru, get out of this particular earth that the demons are taking over and trying to control. So, the line four, down line four, so probably speaking is line one. Thus, people are paying money to ascend, attend some classes, gymnastic exercises, deep breathing, and they're happy if they think they can extend their lifetimes by a few years or enjoy a better sex life. In other words, they're trying to get this physical body to give them as much sense gratification as possible. Because it's frustrating. It's frustrating. So they don't have an alternative. Unfortunately, they know about religion, but religion is also not helping very much. This is why... Sri Krishna tells Arjun, Shabadama Parita Jamami Kam Saranam Bhaja. Abandon all varieties of religion and surrender to me. The main thing in life that gives happiness of the soul, internal happiness, is surrender to Krishna. Surrender to Krishna means obey the instructions that Krishna has said to obey. In other words, he's explained it all in the Bhagavad Gita. You go by the instructions that Arjuna is asking the questions for our sake. So when you take that, the questions, and Krishna explains it, Everything has to be according to Krishna's plan. So then it comes to, I remember this uh, last a couple of Sundays ago, I was in Baltimore, and the question, the point came up. So if we depend on Krishna, if we surrender to Krishna, does that mean we can't plan anything? Well, the answer is yes, we can plan. You can plan every day, but after the plan, you should make a prayer that if this is what you want, Sri Krishna, then let it happen like this. And if not, then change it. In other words, you should plan, but in your mind, that plan should be a loose plan. Loose for us, and firmed up by Krishna, as Krishna wants. So that way, there is some activity. There is some planning. But, as Krishna is saying to Arjun, do not be attached to the results. You leave Krishna to turn it the way he wants to. 
Because in the end, you will see that it was the most beneficial thing. Krishna owns everything. We can plan, he owns us and our intelligence. So how much can we plan based on Krishna, I mean, uh, 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 compared to what Krishna actually can plan? So if we give ourselves like that, that all right, Krishna, this is what I'm thinking. Even if you advance, you say, this is by your mercy what's coming to me. This is what really you should be saying. Okay. But if it is the way you think it should be, then let it manifest like that. And if not, then let it go. Jesus, Lord Jesus, prayed the same prayer in the wilderness before he got uh, captured and, and crucified. He was praying. He knew this was going to happen. He was, in a, of course, very meditative mood about it. And he said, almost like a human, if you know you're going to get killed, you pray to your father, you say, if it's possible, then let this incident pass me by. Not, not, let it not happen to me. It was a lot of, lot, of, lot of pain he was going to go through. But after he said that, he said, but if that's what you want, then that's all right. If that's what you want, then it's all right. So that is the mood. That is the mood. We plan, we wish for something to happen a certain way, but it's non-devotees that try to push, 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 push. It doesn't matter how many people they step on to get what they want. We always, the devotees will always be, I look, I'm looking at it this way, by your mercy, if that's what you want, let it happen that way. And if not, then let it happen the way you want it. My spiritual master says, he uses a strong word. If that's what you want, that's not what you want, sabotage it. <laughs> Lord, sabotage your plans if you don't want it that way. So he uses the word sabotage. It's just that kind of mood that he has. But then change it, you know, like that. So then you plan and always you let the Lord control it. That way you're humble. You're giving your life practically to the Lord. That way. It's that simple. But if you want to do it, it's, it's always better. Next is, so properly speaking, we can never, oh no, I've just gone past it, right? Um, people are paying money to ascend some classes in gymnastics and deep breathing to try to enjoy sex life. Okay, now, but we must understand that this is not actual yoga system. So what they're doing basically is what we'll put it on the Hatha Yoga, trying to get the body and the, and the chakras lined up properly and, and so that the body is at the optimum health situation so that they can enjoy sense gratification with it. But sense gratification ends in death. If we deal with the body only, the body will disappoint. As we know, 80, 90 years old, the body is very weak. And then it leaves. And then the soul is not properly cared for. So that's a waste of time then. It's a waste of time. Okay? So always, whatever we do materially, and right now our lives are such that for most of us, most of our time is spent doing material things, jobs and so on. It's material things. But whatever you have to do, that is spiritual, we should give our greatest <coughs> attention to it. Right now in our lives, most of us have less time compared you know, to do the spiritual thing compared to the time put in doing the material thing. Because in the daytime, if we work eight hours a day, that's eight hours that's gone. That mostly was all on material things. Now, <coughs> a few hours you may spend chanting and reading. But those are the times that you should really be in the optimal, give your best intelligence, give your best mind and body to that, more so than the work situation. I know the work, the supervisor is there expecting you to do this and this and this and this. And that's the difference. Krishna doesn't have a supervisor on you to do this, 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 and this. Even when you have a guru, the guru guides you, but the guru doesn't force you. Okay? But you must understand that what I do materially is going to end in death, and what I do spiritually is going to save my soul. That You should have that understanding. And so from that, then, then you actually seriously take everything you do, you know, spiritually, that you take more seriously. That you take more seriously. And keep telling your mind, keep telling your mind, keep telling your mind, keep telling, spiritual is more important than material. Spiritual is more important than material. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. I'll tell you a story about it. This is in my own... Uh, family, not too long ago, in fact, this week, earlier this week, uh, over on Sunday night, so last week. Um, at home, normally, last week, Friday, it's only two days ago, Friday. So, I was supposed to take my van in the Toyota dealership for maintenance. They were doing brake work, and they were going to inspect it also. 
Um, yeah, normally, I don't. I work in Indiana, Pennsylvania. It's about three hours from home. And so when I'm gone, it's my wife and the children who are like teenagers. So they want us to open the altar and do the, you know, in the morning, do that kind of work. So I'm thinking they'll do that. I was very tired coming home Thursday night. So went to bed, got up in the morning. My wife gets up. She says she started late. The children are going to school. She should open the altar. She's telling me that she's going to be late for work, so she's going to leave. And I'm looking at my time that if I do the author thing, I'm also going to be late for the appointment for the van, the dealership. So I told her that this is my situation. She says, but I have to go. So she left. And so, of course, the author is not going to force me to do anything to it. The DD is not going to force me to do anything. But then I had to think, all right, if you do, if you open the author, you're definitely going to be late. So what do you do? So, of course, the first thing that came to mind is Maya. Leave it and go and come back later on and open. The... After all, it's your appointment at 8 o'clock. You can get there. Maybe by 10 o'clock, you're back. And I said, maybe. My intelligence is maybe. You don't know when you get back. You don't know what the situation is with the van. It may be a simple thing. It may not be. So, I made the decision that, okay, I'm going to err on the part of getting the auto open. So, I took a shower, changed normally what I do, and I put on the sushi dhoti. And went and did this, and I knew when it was 8 o'clock, and I know that they had showed up, they opened the, the dealership. I called them on the cell phone, I told them, all right, I'm going to be late. I know them quite well, because I haven't been taken. Because Stacy, that's the second, the one that answers the phone. Says, hey, this is Patrick, I'm running late. He said, okay, 15 minutes late. <laughs> she said, okay, should I bring the van? Say, yeah, bring it. Bring it. So then I took it there. And they checked into it. And I said, I'm hearing metal to metal. The devotees and others that were seeing him were falling in love with him. And if you fall in love with someone, that's a personality that so many people want to see him. And he's telling you, do this. And you're in love with them. You're going to do it. And what was he saying? Chanda Hare Krishna. And he was making it very exciting. And they were just following and chanting, just really, really, really getting maddened with the love for Godhead. They didn't know he was the Lord himself, except his confidential associates. They didn't know there was a Lord himself. So they were falling in love with this very, very, very charismatic man, extremely, he's tall and extremely handsome. But through that, they developed a love of Godhead. Just like that. So that's why you're giving to some of the prayers that say that in Tasmai Maha Prema Ras Pradaya, you're giving love, free, Krishna Prema Ras easily, freely to people. So that's what we got now. Um, so indeed, the Bhagavad Gita proclaims that the Mahatmas, the great souls, are always chanting the glories of the Lord. You see, they are always remembering Krishna and remembering Krishna, hearing about Krishna and chanting Krishna's name. So they're always immersed in thoughts of Krishna and therefore love of Krishna. So it continues, if one wants to be a Mahatma in this terms of the Vedic literature, in terms of Bhagavad Gita, and in terms of the great authorities, then one has to adopt this process of Krishna consciousness and of chanting Hare Krishna. <coughs> so you hear, you chant, you remember the Lord, you pray to the Lord, you worship a deity, you offer obeisances to deities and devotees, becoming the Lord's servant, Becoming the Lord's friend, just like in the sense because we hear from Arjun, and, and, but basically in terms of hearing him, and then you surrender fully to the Lord. These are the nine processes. The hearing, chanting, remembering, praying, worshipping, offering obeisances, becoming the Lord's servant, becoming a friend, and surrendering fully. Okay. Those are the nine processes for being um, of service to the Lord. Hearing and chanting. We're doing hearing now. I'm also hearing. You know, the voice is coming from me. I'm also hearing because I've prayed the Lord, whatever he wants to preach. So I'm asked, everything is not good just for you, it's good for me also. Now everything, we're all, we're all benefiting at the same time. See? So, um, so I'm down to nine, let's see, but, but if we are content and making a show of meditation by simply, by simply sitting very straight in a lotus position 
and go into some trance like some sort of performer, then that's a different thing. Of course, that's a waste of time. We should understand that such show battle performances have nothing to do with the actual perfection of yoga. And then very important, the material disease cannot be cured by artificial medicine. In fact, material problems can be cured by spiritual realizations, spiritual activities. We have to take real cure straight from Krishna. And he has said, we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So, His Holiness Swami Dhammada Goswami, and the greatest disease, oh, by the way, when do we normally end? The greatest disease in the minds of a scientist is that they do not believe something is a fact unless proven by a scientific experiment. And here's the problem. <coughs> they don't believe something is a fact until it is proved by scientific experiments. But they also know, they also know that there's a lot of things that their scientific instruments cannot prove or cannot even detect. So I work with them. These <laughs> research science, I'm in the university, I work with them, and I know their mentality. In fact, they should be the ones that should be most Krishna conscious. If they really aren't such, didn't have such big egos, what they do in the experiments, in the labs and so on, should prove the greatness of Krishna. Because they try to imitate or they try to produce what is done in nature, and they don't get anywhere close to how fast nature does things. And they know this. When a person eats, the enzymes in the body help to do the digestion very quickly. They have come to know the process to research. If they try to do it in the lab by themselves, it takes months and months and months, a thing that enzyme can do in seconds. It takes months and months and months and months to get the same, accomplish the same reaction. Now, wouldn't that tell you that they're obviously a superior personality that could do things way more than they can? That alone should be reason for them to bow to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the point is, they want to be controllers. So they want to come up with the research and say, we have done this, we have done this, we have done this. Unless we say it is, then, it, then, then, then basically you wait till we say, they won't say it's not, but they wait, you wait till we say it is. All right? Because they want the ones to be in control all the time. Everybody is listening to them. So continuing, when a scientist makes a statement and he supports the statement with scientific experiments, everyone is completely convinced and no questions are asked. <coughs> well, I've got news for you. Every scientific experiment, even if they say it is whatever they've realized, okay, they never say it is definitively or 100% so. They never do that. And I learned that. I, I did my doctorate in chemistry in Brandeis University. And when I finished my experiment, you do experiments and then you write a book, write a thesis about it. So, and I, you have, um, what you call, the, the professor that's taking you through it, your advisor. So, here I am, four years of doing experiments, and I've lined up my data and all of that. I'm supposed to comment on the data, and that's the nature of the thesis that I was writing. So, I've looked, there's a trend here, and I start talking about the trends. So, this is happening, that's happening, that's happening, that's happening. My discussion. <coughs> Almost 15 handwritten pages of it at that time. 15 handwritten pages, just a section of it, right? Because the book is 300, you know, typewritten pages, but just a section of it. I showed it to my advisor, and he threw it away. And I'm going, all that work that I did. So I just calmly asked him, why did you do that? <laughs> why did you do that? We've been through the experiment, you've seen the data, and now I'm commenting about the data, and you just throw the comments away. He said, you don't get it. You don't say that such and such and such is happening, according to my data. You say such and such and such may be happening. Apparently, this is what's going on. Okay? I'm assuming that this is going on. In other words, you never say that 100% this is going on. Then I asked him why. They said, well, later on, when people have come with more refined equipment, right, and somebody does the experiment, he may disprove you. So you don't start by saying it is because it's going to say it is not. So you say it may be so. So if they say it's not, then you say, well, I didn't say it was. <laughs> it may be. This is science now. I think of some of this in there. So everything, you look at the article, even if you have data that follows a particular trend, you have to say this trend may be happening. You don't say it is happening. You always say maybe. 
So then I asked him question, well, what is, what is then? What's absolute? And that took me to Christian. That was my road to Christian consciousness. Because I'm thinking, I've worked four years just to say, maybe, maybe, maybe. But he's my advisor. If I don't write maybe, he's not going <laughs> to give me a PhD. So what do I do? I just wrote maybe and got a PhD off, still knowing that he can't, something is wrong with this, this picture. Right? And so through that, and slowly, a couple of years later, I got to know about Christian consciousness. Now the Lord is absolute. There is no maybe, maybe, maybe. That's just the way it is. This is the way it is. So the scientific instruments, right now, there's already an email from a head of the department. There's a new machine that's come out, and some company representatives are going to come demonstrate how it works. It's supposed to be a better machine that gives more results. And that goes back to my advisor said, see, later on they will come up with something better, and then some of your things will have to be tweaked. So never say it is. So science, they go by just maybe, maybe, maybe. That's the way it is now. Right now, it's based on that. So Christian consciousness is one that's absolute. All right. So when we talk about, <coughs> all right, before the, after that says, scientists only draw conclusions from imprecise measuring instruments. Just like I said, there's a new instrument that's out now that does even better work. According to that, so that shows that the instruments before were not that precise. There's some error in the uh, way they take data. They make a lot of assumptions. That is a huge statement. They make a lot of assumptions. They make a lot of assumptions. I was teaching, I was going to teach, no, actually, I was there at the time, Juniata uh, College. It's in Huntington, not far from here, here in Pennsylvania. And I wanted to do some research with, with the physical chemist uh, professor, Paul Shetler. So he had to explain what he was doing up to the point so I could you know, go on with him. And he started, and I'm hearing what he's saying. He's very good you know, with, with uh, physical chemistry. So he's explaining, but he started with one assumption, and then after that, he put another assumption on top of that assumption and put another one on top, and I'm saying, no wonder you're not getting anywhere. <laughs> I'm not telling you, but I'm, you know. And the very embarrassing thing started happening. I was not enough. I was getting sleepy, right? But it, I could not stop myself from sleeping because I knew that he had done so many assumptions that if I start breaking it down, I'm going to disprove him. But at the same time, you have to be nice because he's listening to you. But this is what happens. So many assumptions. Why? Because they don't know so many things about how the world came to be. They really don't know. And they go on different assumptions, as is later on here, Darwin talking about, you know, everything came from a simplified thing. The birds and the fish and all of that, they all came from one source. And over time, as they developed other parts of it, okay, and then they became more complicated. They became, after a while, a different entity, okay? I'm hoping you're listening to this going to one ear and out the other ear because it doesn't make sense. But this is Darwin who is actually praised as the you know one describing how creation came to be. And he's saying that once simple entity developed other things about it, like maybe there was somebody, some particular entity walking the earth and finally he developed wings and therefore he learned to fly and he became a bird. You could have been a fish, for all you can. The wings became longer, and now he's learned to fly. This is what he's... And people actually hear this and think it is okay. So this is Darwin's thing. And then, but it's funny, there's something about Darwin himself that said that, but, but if there are other types of bodies who are already, or which are already advanced, then my theory has faults with it. Of course it has faults with it. <laughs> there's a lot of faults with it, right? So... This is the idea of, well, then they said, but what about the older ones? Now, we came, they say the human being came from what? The monkey? And you know, this big size and all of that, and finally we became, and then I'm saying, okay, well, the question that was asked is, how come monkeys are not becoming humans now? The monkeys in Renavon have never been human, they're still monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so if their process came from monkey to human, then there should be, even if humans are making other humans, babies, there should be monkeys still turning into humans. But we don't see that. So then how good is Darwin's theory? Mm -hmm. This is towards the end of the same back to basically he talks about Darwin. It's not, it doesn't make sense, but that was his assumption. And his assumption, right, speaking about assumptions, that was his assumption. And he's also saying, he was actually praising the fact that 
you should be able to speculate, make assumptions. And so now this is his preface. That is what he started with. So everybody, an intelligent person should be able to make assumptions. Therefore, I made assumption, and the human came from the monkey. Except that we don't see any monkeys turn to humans anymore. So we're not that crazy to think about that. But this was praised very highly at that time. Not to mention the fact that the earth was flat. According to some people, the earth was flat. Okay. Imagine those in school at the time that they said the earth was flat. If you write an exam, what's the shape of the earth? You add round, that would be wrong. <laughs> and you fail, and you get an F. Even though <laughs> the statement is not true. Until one person traveled, started one point, and went around and came back to the same place. Any direction you turn, you go back to the same place. It can be flat, because if it's flat, you go to the edge, you're supposed to fall off. <laughs> the edge. <laughs> but no, you don't. Therefore, it can't be. This is how it was disproven. So, that's material energy, material um, it, uh, knowledge. It's very, 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 very temporary, and it changes all the time. Um, yeah, um, we're actually almost at, at the point. I'm going to fast forward because I'm looking at the time. In one of a letter written to A.R. Wallace, December 20, 1857, just uh, um, going over, going back over the point, and that is. He says, I'm a firm believer that without speculation, there is no good and original observation. So here it is. He says, uh, you, you ought to be able to speculate. You ought to be able to think about what you think is going on. No wonder they say the world started with a big bang, big bang theory. That's how the world came about. Some people are saying the big bang theory. And the reason is, well, there's a big bang because <coughs> the universe is expanding. So well, everybody expands. Don't children grow? Everybody expands. That's a big, big deal. They don't expand by big bangs. And the other thing is, Big Bang Theory, they say there was a big explosion and then things came to be. Now, how can you have an explosion and things become so organized? Explosion, things are all over the place. Become disorderly. The world is so orderly that the animals, depending on what they have for other, even the food chain, which goes for what? Mm, the trees, the birds, and what they eat, and where they sleep. All of that is unknown by the intelligence of these animals and these birds. So how come a Big Bang will cause all of that? Big Bang give water? How can explosion give water? You think explosion, you think of fire, right? But water will put it out. But we have water. Bodies of water and things that are done. And even people thinking in terms of how they put buildings together, blueprints and all of those things, they can't come from an explosion. It just can't come from explosion. Explosion causes chaos. It doesn't cause order. But the world is orderly. So here comes Big Bang Theory. That's useless. The next is, the next ten, um, paragraph, as Darwin writes, in the origin of species, it's quite conceivable, okay, so it's quite conceivable, which means he's assuming now. First he said I should be able to assume that a naturalist might come to the conclusion that species had not been independently created but had descended from varieties of other species. Like I said, you know, the fish may turn into a bird, and the monkey turn into a human being. Um, Darwin has no knowledge of the nature of a spirit soul. So the reality is, all bodies are created, 8,400,000 of them, and the soul goes into, for those coming to the material world, goes into this particular physical body, which then expands, Okay, and forms a live entity, human or otherwise. And the spirit soul transmigrates from one species to another. At death, then the subtle body takes the soul to the next existence based on what the person is thinking. And that's why when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, then we have thoughts of Krishna. So then when the person leaves the body, then they go into Krishna because that's what they've been thinking about. Going to Krishna means leaving this Terrible, 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 terrible Machaloka, terrible material world. Everywhere in the material world, there's, there's problems. Heavenly planets, medium planet like this, and hellish planets, all problems. It's just different varieties of problems, different levels of problems. So in the, he the spiritual world, in the um, spiritual world, none. None. No anxiety. Vaikuntha means no anxiety. Kunta means anxiety. So Vaikuntha means no anxiety. So everything is provided. So, um, Darwin has no knowledge about the transmigration of the soul from species to another. Um, he does not know whether there's further evolution to the human platform 
and he doesn't have the slightest idea the total number of species through the cycle of evolution goes on. See, evolution is used here also, but it's an evolution from one species to another from development of from the aquatic life to the tree life to the insect life to the bird life to the animal life and then to the human life. That's also there. But it's not like the uh, fish became a bird. I mean, that, that kind of thinking that, that um, no, not like that. But in advancement to the human body, the human body is the one that has the opportunity to understand about Krishna because every other species can eat, they can mate, they can sleep, they can defend, but they don't know about God. Only the human intellect has that opportunity. And we are very, very, very few as far as the percentage is concerned. 8,400,000 bodies, only 400,000 is human type. Now, if you take it in percentages, it's less than 5% of the types of human, of, of types of physical bodies, right? Physical bodies are human. Over 95% of it is not human. So we are in the type of bodies now that can understand Krishna. More than 95% of the types of bodies that are there, they can't understand Krishna. So it's a huge, 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 huge opportunity now. Once you're in the human body and then you come into the human body and also come to know about this particular path, to take it very seriously. Take it very, 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 very seriously. Because that's a very, very, very small percentage. Less than 5%. If that is if you divide 400,000 by 8,400,000 and multiply by 100, this is a very small percentage. Very small percentage. So it's very important to take this seriously. Um, I'm going to kind of fast forward to try to end it because we are 12 10 now. Um, before it says discovery, part, this is the last paragraph there. Before it says discovery and understanding and so on. As a crude example, species portrayed in ancient Egypt pyramids were those. But it's the same as those we meet in the present day. So they're making the point. Since time immemorial, the peacock, the way it looks like, is the same it looks like. So this Darwin thing that they go from one to another, and as you know, humans are humans. Monkeys have never become humans. And so this thing of going from one simpler species to a more complicated species, that doesn't hold at all here. Okay. So the last thing is, with this poor fund of knowledge, Darwin concluded that some species become extinct in the process of evolution. That's what he was saying. He says, you know, you, the process, you develop, become more advanced, and then the process just drops. So then if they said the monkeys became humans, then the monkeys should have been extinct now because humans are more advanced than monkeys. But the monkeys are still there. The humans are also there. So even this whole thing about uh, get a more complicated body from a simpler body, and then the more complicated body stays and the simpler body becomes extinct, or that they die off. That also doesn't hold. If you're just taking monkey and humans, monkeys are still there. Humans are still there. They didn't come. From, we didn't come from monkeys, and the monkeys didn't leave either. Okay, so this is completely wrong. Completely wrong. Okay, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, um, what do you do normally? Bring these questions up. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now it's time for you to say your realizations. Why do scientists find it difficult to accept the existence of the soul? What do you think? <coughs> Why do they find it difficult to accept the existence of the soul? They really ought to, but... <laughs> they have no machines to... Uh, no scientific way to... Yes, they have no machines. That's how they think. If they have the <laughs> machines, that's an excellent answer. <laughs> if they have the machines to prove something, then they say that thing exists. Since they don't have... Uh, machine to prove the existence of the soul that they have difficulty accepting that. Yeah, that's good. Any other suggestions for that? Why do scientists find it difficult to accept the existence of the soul? Yeah, I'll add something to it. If they ever knew anything about this process, there's a soul and the soul's existence. The one big problem is their ego. Their ego. They haven't seen the soul, they're going to tell you it doesn't exist. Because they haven't seen it. Of course, they use their, their, their uh, instruments to try to prove things. And we already talked to you, they do a lot of assumptions. So that's already that. They use the instruments to produce things. But their ego, because they want to be the controllers, so they want what they think is happening to be the one that everybody should believe. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's also the presence. How can we come to understand the presence of the soul? That's all. That you can preach from, from the point of view of Shastra. How can we come to understand the presence of the soul? Because if the body is there, mm -hmm. the body after the soul goes stays as it is, but it doesn't move. Yeah. So there is some life force which was there before, a second after the leaves, uh, the body just stays there. Right? So if it doesn't move or it doesn't do. In it, it can't it's lifeless. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. The idea of the presence of a soul is because the soul is the one that makes the body work. When the soul comes out, the body doesn't function anymore. We call that death. So, yes, even if we don't know the nature of a soul, the fact that there's something that causes the body to move, and when that thing is not there anymore, then the body can't move. So that thing is actually the real person, which we call the soul. Excellent answer. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, after the soul leaves our body, mm -hmm. then where the soul goes to? Where does the soul go? Okay. I'll try to summarize as quickly as possible. Um, the bodies and non bodies are different things that happen to them. So we take a non body situation. That's a lot of the people, majority of people. So when the soul leaves, that is, that simultaneous leaving of the body and the soul coming out, that's what we call death. We have a physical body, which everybody can see a physical body. Then there's also a subtle body, then the soul. So at death, the subtle body comes out with the soul in the subtle body, and that is escorted. The Lord makes an arrangement for it to be escorted to the next body based on what the person was thinking. What the person, in other words, you're going to become what you're thinking. Right? That's the, basically what it is. And it, that's a simplistic way to put it. Sometimes some people are taking the hellish planets for punishment. Some people are taking for heavenly planets for enjoyment for a period of time. And then, so there's transmigration from one body to another. Now, for devotees, the process is also the same in that the subtle body and the soul will come out of the physical body at death. But a devotee that has, in fact, received the mercy of the Lord and can go back to the spiritual world, they are escorted to the spiritual world, not with the subtle body. The physical body dies, we know that. Okay? But the subtle body is also killed by Krishna. Nobody can kill the subtle body. Mind, intelligence, and falsity, I and mean, the ego, that's what makes the subtle body. That's killed by Krishna, and then the, the soul is released. The soul is very minute in the body now, but that's by design in the body. So when that happens, then the soul expands to the full being that's in the spiritual world. So it does expand to full being and then back to the spiritual world. So that's what happens. We have a spiritual world too. We have the, all the souls go to the spiritual world. The spiritual world is actually the biggest. This life is actually in the spiritual world. We are in the material world. The material world is a cosmic prison. It's actually a, that's why we go to so much suffering here. Okay? It is a prison for those who did wrong. And they were put here. Those who were envious or challenging the Supreme Personality of God had been put here and given these physical bodies. And the show was shrunk into a very minute thing in the heart area. That's why we point the heart like, you know, real, yeah. So when the soul, after going through this process, is to go back to Godhead, we get the mercy of the Lord to go back to Godhead. Then the soul comes out, the subtle body comes out, sometimes we call it the dream body, same thing as subtle body. Okay? And then the soul is now released and expands and meets the soul. Supreme Lord. The spiritual world is three times bigger than the material world. It's that big. The material, all, the material world has billions of universes and the spiritual world is even three times bigger. So the majority of the people are in the spiritual world. Just like even if we compare now, the majority of the people are outside prisons, right? Only a few people are in the prison compared to the whole population. So in the cosmic, we, are, we seem like a lot, but in Krishna's creation, we are very, very few. The majority of them the uncountable number are still in the spiritual world and enjoying no problems that we're going through here. So that's the way it is. Okay, good question. Any other question? Okay. Um, why is he still not authentic? I think we went through a lot of that. I, we're going to jump that one. Um, maybe just the last question. What is the Vedic explanation to how we are evolved from? The Vedic explanation to that. How we evolved. 
Should I tackle that one? Because I think I gave an answer to you know, unless you have thoughts about it. When a person or when an entity is so sinful that they get degraded into lower species, depending on how to yeah. Somebody is saying, you know about Hitler, right? Somebody made a prediction the next life will be probably being a worm. Party. I mean that's what happens. We do grievous since you promote I mean demote it way, way, way down to low very, very, very low species. So from the low species, the evolving is aquatic life, tree life, insect life, bird life, I have a program on my bird life, animal life, and if I'm animal life, human. So that's how the evolution goes like that. But within that, you know, then once you get the human life and you still think I love cats so much, it would be nice to be a cat. Well, you be a cat next life. <laughs> and you go back now like that. But when you turn to Hare Krishna, then Yamaraj doesn't take care of your account anymore. Krishna himself takes care of the body spiritual accounts. It's very, very, very rare that the body will be in a, anybody than a human being. Even if they're not successful, they'll be in the human body next life. Again, and again introduce the Krishna consciousness. Once you're in, you will stay in lifetime after lifetime until finally get the mercy to go back. So that's the mercy. Okay. So the both five keys. Sorry, right, that went a little longer. No problem. But, um, it's perfectly fine. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Very good question.
Krishna, 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 Krishna,
Because Arjun doesn't like movies. He <laughs> 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 doesn't like surprises movies? either. So, <laughs> so well, we welcome to that, stay. Yeah, welcome to uh, stay <laughs> over. Uh, like you know, to watch the movie. Ah. Uh, no, it's a long movie though. Unfortunately, it's like three hours. Long. Oh, three hours. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, close some of it? three hours long. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, two hours fifty minutes to be precise. So um, there's an intermission in between. Uh, inter- Maybe we can watch half today. And uh, yeah, it's up to up to everybody. Like you know, I mean, if you want to kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want a part of it that's also welcome, sure. like, you know. Yeah. Uh, I guess uh, people have to go home for all this. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where would that be shown? Uh, it will be upstairs in the family.